book of Judges. Uh, we're in chapter 3. and I've been saying all along that the book of Judges is a picture, you might say. A perfect picture of us. Now, what do I mean by us? Well, you fill in the blank, okay? It can be you and me individually. We can be talking about a church. We can be talking about a nation. And I guess we could just start with the biggest picture there, the, the nation. The book of Judges is a picture of us, okay? So Israel, Israel was God's people. I think a lot of times when we look at America, we think the same thing, right? God's people, God's nation. Israel was God's chosen nation. America is God's chosen nation, right? God bless Israel. God bless America. But here's the thing. Despite the fact that these were God's people, it's crazy. When you read through the book of Judges, you see over and over and over and over again how they fall into complete and total wickedness and moral laxity. They turn away from the way of the Lord and they fall into false worship. Not only does Israel allow the Canaanites to live among them, Israel then fails to even teach the distinction to their children so that a whole generation grows up who doesn't know the way of the Lord, who doesn't know the great things God has done for his people through prophets like Moses and Joshua. A whole generation who doesn't really see much difference in themselves in contrast to the Canaanites that live among them. And, and well, what do we find at the beginning of the chapter we're studying today again, chapter 3? Well, we find that the next generation of Israelites is intermarrying with the Canaanites. Chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And so, of course, this is the pattern then, like I said, that you're going to see throughout the book of Judges. It's almost going to get tiring. It's going to get old. But, you know, here again, we see such a great connection to us. Okay, and us being, well, you fill in the blank, but, but let's start with the big picture again, our nation. The book of Judges spans about 300 to 350 years of history. Well, think about it. Think if we went back 300 or 350 years in our own history. We'd be back in the, the colonial days, the late 1600s, early 1700s. Just think about how much our country, our, our culture, our society has changed in that time. How much we have declined in our moral values and our way of, of walking according to the word of God. Maybe especially, what, the last 50, 60 or so years. Just how many fundamental things, things that have changed in our culture that would probably cause our great-grandparents, our grandparents maybe even, to roll over in their graves if, if they knew the, that their descendants were living in a world that had become so wicked and so morally lax. Of course, then again, I think maybe sometimes we underestimate that there's nothing new under the sun, as the scriptures say. You know, every generation, every generation has its share of, of wickedness, its share of, of turning away from God's word. And like I said, it's the pattern of our lives then, too. We're constantly, as God's people, falling into sin, turning to things of this world and, and loving them and desiring them more than we love and desire and crave the things of God. There may be seasons of great revival in our Christian walk when we're, you know, really living for the Lord. And then there's probably a lot of times when we're down in the mud and the mire and the muck. Now, you know, last week we looked at all this through the lens of Romans chapter 8. And, of course, the keynote verse that a lot of us have memorized from Romans chapter 8 is Romans 8, 28, where it says that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Obviously, God loved us first, right? And so because of God's love revealed to us, we love God, but but in all things, God's working for the good of us. A verse that reminds us that there's no accidents in life, that everything happens for a reason, especially we could say this is the case for believers, for, for God's people. Nothing happens outside of God's will. God's always at work accomplishing good things for us. Now, now we may not always see these things as good. There may be a lot of things that happen in life that we would say are bad, and yet God is bringing forth a good purpose through those things. 
But you know, there's a there's a fascinating verse that follows Romans 8:28 that uh, we don't always uh, memorize, right? We don't always read this far. But Romans 8:29. You ever read Romans 8:29 and and really thought about what it's saying? Let me turn there right quick. Romans 8:29 says, "For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son." In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So, so read these two verses together again. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God is working in all things. God has a plan and purpose in all things that happen in this world, happen in your life and my life. And the good purpose that, that, that he's, he's bringing forth through all things is that he wants to conform us to the image of his son. He's predestined everything for this purpose, to conform us to the image of his son. Now, what is the image of of his son what is the image uh, and we know who his son is right jesus christ what is the image of christ well think of think of the most iconic way that we could represent jesus you know if, if you could just pick one picture of jesus what picture would you choose and well there's lots of great ways to depict our savior but but i i don't think we could argue with the fact that the most iconic way to do so the most classic way to represent jesus would be to represent jesus what jesus crucified jesus hanging on a cross it's the picture of our salvation right so god wants to conform us to the image of his son and what's the image of jesus well the image of jesus at its best is a crucified jesus a crucified christ and so that means what's god wanting to shape us into what's god wanting to do god's wanting to shape us into the image of a crucified christ he wants our lives to, to have that cruciform shape now, you know the cross i think really is a perfect picture of of the christian life you know think of the two parts of the cross you have the the vertical beam and the horizontal beam Okay, and the book of Judges represents this picture well, too. Okay, so, so let's take that vertical beam first, okay? There's a lot of times in life, in this world, when God will directly intervene in order to show his people their sin and to bring them you know, back to the path of God, right? Um, God intervenes through his word all the time. I mean, this message to you today, this Bible study, this video is God's word, okay? God directly intervening in your life, okay? Hopefully you're sitting still long enough to absorb this message. But, but yeah, God is always intervening in various ways. Sometimes, you know, very profound, very direct ways. Um, you know, those wake-up calls that we sometimes call them in life. When, when the bottom falls out and we realize we need God, okay? 9-11 um, was a good example of that. Um, when the Twin Towers fell in New York and, you know, terrorists were hijacking planes and, and, you know, the weeks that followed all of that horrific events, what happened? Churches were full, weren't they, right? It was a wake-up call to a lot of people that we need to get back to the way of God. So sometimes God intervenes directly, maybe in AA, to get our attention. Um, like I said, most commonly that happens through his word, the church, me as a pastor pestering you with God's word, or maybe it's a family member who's always there to remind you of what's right and, and what is godly, uh, because maybe our choices and our lifestyle isn't always reflecting that. But then there's also the, the horizontal beam, okay? The horizontal beam of the cross. And, and you might say that those are just simply the events of life. All the things, a series of things that happen as we walk through life. Some of them good and some of them not good. But it's in the midst of all of these things that God's at work. Shaping us, leading us, guiding us, growing our faith in, in mysterious ways. You know, this is why we as Christians really can and truly can say that there's nothing that happens by accident. 
God's always got a plan and a purpose, and that purpose and that plan is to lead us closer to Him. And so as Christians, then we're looking for that. When when things happen in life that, that puzzle us or, or we just don't understand, why would God let this happen? Well, as Christians, this is the lens right away that, that, that we, we view it through so that we're not led into despair or led to be angry with God. You know, it's okay to be angry with God sometimes, right? A relationship with God's a lot like a marriage. You know, a good marriage has some, some fighting in it, right? A lot of good fighting, but... But it also has a lot of great makeup moments and and so too sometimes we may be upset with the lord but but in the end we come to realize his great and incredible love for us in christ and and so it's because of his love for us that we know that we can endure as romans 8 says then what shall we say you know shall famine or persecution or nakedness or danger or sword separate us from god well of course not he loves us in and through jesus christ it's like the wedding ring that you wear, okay? It's a reminder that we're loved. And you and I know then that we're loved and, and that in all things, our heavenly father, our heavenly groom is looking out for us, his bride. So the book, book of Judges then is a great picture of this. We're going to see this happen over and over and over again. It's like watching an old married couple, okay? They become very predictable, but, but it's such a sweet picture too. We love to, to see an old married couple sitting at a restaurant, you know, eating, and, and it's like they anticipate each other, they, they finish each other's sentences, they know each other through and through. That's the kind of relationship God wants with us, and he's going to move heaven and earth. He's going to use all the events of our life to try to bring that about, uh, to bring us closer to him. But now here's where the book of Judges doesn't always sit well with us, though. I mean, as sweet as that sounds, that we're... we're we're God's bride, and he's our heavenly groom, and we're like an old married couple, and we love each other, and all is so sweet. The thing is, as we read through the book of Judges, what we're going to see is that nine times out of ten, the way that God brings his people back to him is by punishing them, by giving them over to the consequences of their sin. You know, you want to live amongst these Canaanites? You want to dwell amongst these wicked people? You want to marry them and take on their ways and worship their gods? Well, fine, I'll, I'll give you over to them then. And so what we see then is that a lot of times the events that God's working through in the lives of his people in the book of Judges are times that bring oppression and hardship upon them. And you know, I think that's where maybe we get a little uncomfortable as 21st century Americans. Because again, like I said, this is a picture of us too. And you know, let's be honest, we as Americans, we've kind of grown fat on a gospel that is often a little bit too sticky, sweet with platitudes of, of God's love for us, no matter what, right? God loves me no matter what. Well, yes, he does. He loves us. Nothing can separate us from his love for us in Jesus Christ. We just saw that in Romans chapter 8 last week. But his love for us is grounded purely and completely and totally in Jesus Christ. That's, that's maybe the part that we don't always remember. You know, we have this tendency to want to think, well, God loves me for me. I'm special. You know, there, there's something about me that God that God really loves. Some quality about me, right? I'm unique. I'm special. He sees potential in me. But that's not what, well, that's not what Scripture says. That's not what Romans chapter 8 said at all, right? God loves us in Christ. Nothing can separate us from God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Consider what else the book of Romans has to say. Um, Romans chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. And really, really pay attention to the words here. Uh, Romans 5, 8 to 11 says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, now that's a pretty harsh sentence if you really think about it. God shows his love for us. Okay, now love is a good word. We, we like that word, but God shows his love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Death, crucifixion, the horrific events of of Holy Week, when our Lord suffers and dies for the sins of the world, 
This is God's love. Okay, God had to go to this length to show sinners like us his love. So that's verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? We've been justified through his blood, and so now we've been saved from the wrath of God. But wait a minute, Pastor, I thought God loves us. Well, of course he does. But as sinners, we're also under God's wrath. In fact, God has more reason. God has every reason to despise us, to hate us, to have wrath toward us than he ever has to love us. The only reason he loves us is because Jesus died for us. Jesus shed his blood for us. That's what Romans chapter 5 is saying. Let's read on. Romans 5, 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were enemies of God. Paul is saying. Apart from Christ, we're enemies. Apart from Christ, we're under God's wrath. Apart from Christ, we should only expect punishment. We should only expect bad things from Almighty God. But through Christ, because of his death, there's reconciliation. Reconciliation means peace, okay? All the hostilities have been ended. But, but, but notice, only in Christ. If you want to live your life apart from Christ, well, then you should expect nothing but hostility from God, okay? But in Christ, what should we expect? What can we bank on? What can we count on? Well, we can count on the fact that in all things, God is working for the good of those whom he loves and is called according to his purpose, okay? Now, God isn't, you know, out there zapping people with lightning who aren't Christians. No, as Jesus says in the Gospels, God sends rain on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. All right, for the most part, God is a God who loves his creation and is compassionate and patient and kind. But, but as Peter says in his epistles, we shouldn't let that deceive us. Just because God is, is still sending rain to water our crops and, and just because God doesn't lash out with anger over sin immediately, shouldn't deceive us into thinking that he doesn't care about it. You know, judgment is coming and we don't want we don't want to be found under God's judgment apart from Christ. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be nice. And so what is God at work then doing? Well, if God's going to do anything, if God's proper work is doing anything in this world, it's, it's making sure that his, his people, his children, those that he loves, aren't walking too far down a path of sin. God's going to God try to intervene. God's going to use the events of this life, the horizontal beam of the cross, and he's going to use the vertical beam of the cross, his word, to try to turn us away, right? To get us back, back to his way, to back to, to seeing him as our, our God and Jesus as our Savior. I mean, really and truly, this is what makes our theology Christ-centered then. In everything, we recognize that our, our only relationship to God is, is through Jesus Christ. God doesn't love me for me. God loves me for the sake of Christ. And, and thank goodness. Because let's be honest. If God loved me simply because of me, well, yeah, while I may look at myself and think there's lots of great things about Pastor Aaron, I also know, if I'm honest with myself, that there's a lot of things that aren't so great about me. Uh, especially in the eyes of God. You know, if I were to really be honest about that, I know that there's a lot of things that God would look at me and say, well, that's not great. That's not what I love. And you're not the kind of person I want to be my child. So thank goodness God doesn't love me for me. No, God loves me. Why? Because of Jesus. God loves me for the sake of Christ. And I know God loves Jesus, right? The Father and the Son are one, you know? perfect union. And Jesus was the perfect son of God. He fulfilled the law perfectly. Jesus truly died an innocent death. Thank goodness God loves me for the sake of Christ, because I know then that he loves me perfectly. He loves me completely. He loves me totally because he loves Jesus perfectly and completely. 
and totally. And so, you know, a Christ-centered theology, then, our, our Lutheran theology in this way, is, is very grounded in recognizing our sinfulness. Not how great we are, not how good we can be, but rather how sinful we are. And just how much we need a Savior. So that's what God's up to. He's training us. Training us to see Jesus in the worst times of our lives, in the most sinful times of our lives, in the best times of our lives. So let's look back at Judges chapter 3 then. Um, last week we, we highlighted the very first verse, and again I'll, I'll read that very first verse. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. Okay, the Lord left these nations. Yes, Israel is the one that left them. They didn't drive them out as God had said they should. Israel was unfaithful, but way in the background, God's also the one orchestrating things and working for the good of his people. And so he's going to use these Canaanite tribes and, and all these other enemies of God's people. He's going to use them for God's, the good of God's people, uh, even though God's people aren't always going to see it as good. Okay, so let's, let's look at now at uh, Judges chapter 3, verses 7. And we're going to read all the way to 11, verses 7 to 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. No surprise there, okay? They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim, Eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel, who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan, Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest forty years. And then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. All right, so not a whole lot of details there other than what we already know. God's people are wicked and unfaithful. They forget the Lord. They worship false gods. And so what does God do? God raises up salvation for them. God raises up Othniel. Now, Othniel, we don't know a whole lot about him other than the fact that he's mentioned in Joshua chapter 15. He's mentioned in Judges chapter 1. He comes from the line of um, Caleb. Caleb was one of the very, very few faithful uh, men in Israel, going all the way back to the, the days when they wandered in the wilderness. Uh, it, Caleb and Joshua were the only two of the 12 spies who had returned with a positive report of the land, who in faith said, guys, we can do this. All the rest of the spies said, no, 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 we have to go back to Egypt. God has, has brought us here to destroy us. And so God had promised that, that Caleb and his family would inherit a special portion of the land. And so Othniel then is, is Caleb's nephew. And in Joshua 15 and also in Judges chapter 1, we see that Othniel is a man who has zeal for the promises of God. He goes and he takes hold of the land that God has given. Um, he drives out the Canaanites from, from his particular portion of the land. And, and apparently he then uses his example, right, to, to, to help lead Israel to do this. After eight years of oppression by this, this king with a really long, strange name, uh, it's funny, the, the Hebrew here is kind of a, a play on words. You, you might say that um, it's a nickname that they give this king of Mesopotamia. Uh, he's Kushan, the, the doubly wicked, the Hebrew says, or, or you could even translate it further, uh, the doubly wicked one from the land of the double rivers, okay? Um, He's a really bad guy. He's iconically bad. And yet, what do we know? Well, we know that God's at work here too, okay? God doesn't like Kushan Rishathaim's, the doubly wicked one's wickedness, but he is going to use this wicked one to chasten his people and to show them their need for salvation, to show them their need for him and his word. And so God raises up Othniel for this purpose. But Othniel, while he, he does deliver Israel and, and brings peace for 40 years, obviously isn't the ultimate deliverer. I mean, he dies, right? 
and Israel's going to fall back into wickedness, and Israel's going to fall back into oppression. Now, obviously, like we're going to see each and every time, Israel needs a better Savior. We need a better Savior than Othniel, right? We need Jesus.